mentioned about this talk and uh, organizing these meetups, I think they're very important to bring the community closer together and also to do it right now in this talk to disseminate knowledge about actual practical <coughs> use cases of data science and here deep learning specifically. So what can we um, want to welcome you to this talk? Uh, it's going to last for about 45, 60 minutes, and then of course we'll be here for you for any question you might have. The talk, as you probably know, will all will be all about deep learning applied to typical industrial problems, namely predictive maintenance, predictive quality, and visual inspection. So who are we, the ones presenting here? Uh, my colleague Daniel, he's data scientist at Craftworks and has a background in biomedical engineering from Imperial College, College London, and myself, uh, yeah, the right person here, Simon. Uh, I'm leading the AI agenda at Craftworks, and I'm a lecturer at some universities, and also have a background in machine learning from University College London. So we do have the academic background, actually, for the topic as well. Uh, who is Craftworks? So Craftworks, and I hope some of you know the company, uh, we are a software engineering artificial intelligence company based right in the heart of Vienna, in the 7th district. Um, right now, I think it's a bit outdated actually. We are a bit more people now, I think 17, 18. Um, mostly engineering driven, like I would say like 90-95% of our uh, employees actually have some kind of engineering background, ranging from software engineering to machine learning to biomedical engineering and pretty much you know, everything around that. Well, we are, especially in the artificial intelligence sector, we are focused on industrial artificial intelligence. So applying methods from AI, so that could be machine learning, that could be deep learning, but it could also be optimization to solve problems from the industry, from manufacturing, the automotive industry, and so on. Um, that's also typical where our clients come from, and I promise this is probably the last slide of the company that I want to dive into the topic. Um, so yeah, we have quite a diverse set of um, customers, mostly from industry, as you can see, and well, we do solve challenging industrial problems for them. Well, the industry poses a very specific set of challenges typically, right? Very, very prominent are problems such as quality control, right? When you think about an automotive manufacturer, it's, it's critical, really critical to produce, to make sure that the things you produce are of high quality, they work as expected, as they should work, right? So it's a very, very prominent case of applying artificial intelligence methods in the, in the automotive industry, for example, is quality control. Another popular case that many of you at least are familiar with on a shallow level could be predictive maintenance, you know, here. Having a machine defect can be incredibly costly in, in when you, when you think of large production lines, right? One machine defect can mean uh, a standstill of an entire production line for a couple of hours, and that could potentially cost tens or hundreds of thousands of euros, right? So this is a use case, a challenge, that is tackled quite frequently in the industry, especially in the production industry. Right? You want to predict when maintenance should be done so that you can minimize the occurrence of downtimes. And for these challenges, in our context, in the context of Craftworks, uh, we use, well, methods from, art, from the artificial intelligence field to solve these challenges, these industrial challenges. And, well, I agree with, uh, with the organizer here that I'm also a big fan of the word artificial intelligence. So to make it more concrete, as already no uh, noted, it's mostly about machine learning, deep learning, and optimization here, but also, you know, more classical approaches such as um, yeah, regression, if you do not want to call it, it's machine learning. So, you know, methods are just a tool to solve the problem. Well, also the characteristics of these industrial challenges um, are special, right? I always say industrial AI is kind of a character, it is special. Namely, in essentially two terms. On the one hand, the data. When you think about machines, many machines in a production line, and each of these machines has tens or even hundreds of sensors, right? And each sensor records a data point every second, or maybe even every 100 milliseconds, you face really high frequency data, which often poses a challenge at inference time. Right? Your predictions need to be fast. On the other hand, you can imagine that if you have a couple of these machines, many of these sensors, 
you know, they really generate big data. So we're talking about hundreds of gigabytes, we're talking about terabytes here. That's also something you typically face in industrial challenges. And then the data, well, as it's actually the case in many areas, is it lacks standardization. You know, it always the, the data format depends on the machine, it depends on the settings, it depends on the sensors on it, it depends on the location and the customer and so on, right? And that really makes it necessary to build solutions individually in most cases. There are hardly any off-the-shelf solutions you can actually use to solve quite common uh, industry problems such as predictive maintenance. Of course, also, imbalanced classes are a problem you face in pretty much every problem here. Because when you think about maintenance, right, predictive maintenance, you want to predict when a machine is going to fold, when it's going to have a defect. Well, the bad thing is machine defects do not happen very often. So you just don't have any positives, or very few positives. And that's what you typically have to do with deal with imbalanced data. And also on the algorithm side, it's, it's a character, right? Um, your algorithms, your models, your software needs to be reliable. Think of uh, predictive quality, a quality assessment. Uh, it would be quite a catastrophe if your model would suddenly not do, not behave as expected and bad quality parts would be shipped to customers, right? So you do have quite high reliability requirements in many cases. And also interpretability is something that is uh, in high demand these days. When you think about explainable AI and so on, the buzzword. So customers, they are not satisfied with just getting that prediction, especially when it's about, you know, high value stuff. So when it's about tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of euros. Because they want humans to be able to interpret the results. So interpretability is a big thing right now. And it's something that is kind of expected for, for almost every solution these days. Well, so that was basically a bit of introduction to industrial AI to frame the setting we are, we are in here and to give a bit of an overview of the challenges and characteristics. In the remainder of the presentation, we will go into that in, in three specific areas. And for each of these sections, we will first look into a bit of a theoretical approach and see how that looks in theory and what the problem is and how it can be solved. And the second part of each of these sections, we will look into how we solve that concretely for our customer, right? So a really practical use case straight out to real life. Well, and at that point, I also hand over to Daniel. Thank you. All right. Um, so let's um, dive straight in. So we will start with predictive maintenance. And basically the goal here is, um, as um, Simon already mentioned, it's um, to predict and forecast um, the condition of machines so that operators then can plan and optimize um, the maintenance schedules. Um, another thing that Simon already covered in a way, um, but like everyone can imagine like how expensive and how, how much of a pain it is for big companies if, if their machine falls. Um, it can stop the whole production and the yeah, the repair costs are, are usually very expensive when it's um, unplanned, both um, when it comes to the um, human resources, but also the equipment, um, yeah, just facilitating um, something in an emergency case uh, might be tricky. And also, of course, it could be that um, it implies a safety risk for, for humans if um, machines are defect. So, um, that's why on the other side you have predictive maintenance as the, the proactive solution for, for companies um, where they can rely on machine um, health forecasts that will help them plan and optimize the um, maintenance schedules and then um, plan targeted um, cost and time efficient um, maintenance work. So when we talk about um, predictive maintenance, the big foundation here is, is sensor data. Um, we talk about um, yeah, machine-centric data that ideally captures the um, condition of the machine over time. So it's um, a time series. And yeah, just a couple of examples that you could look into. It's, um, for example, the temperature that's measured in the machine, or pressure values, or the vibration. But it could also just be a microphone placed near um, your machine, and then you're relying on acoustic signals. And the, the hypothesis is that um, in, in, in this data you, file, uh, you, you will find characteristic patterns um, that you can then um, yeah, link to um, um, issues with the machines. 
And so then it's important to have, on the other side, um, maintenance data. So you, you need um, records of when um, um, you know, there were faults on the machine. And um, this is a important ground truth, but it comes with some issues. Because usually you, um, when you have maintenance records, it's actually only the, the time when the thing was repaired, for example, that it's low. And not necessarily the start of the fault itself. So um, you don't necessarily know how long um, the issues um, pre like, are before the actual onset of the, when it's noticed. And of course, it could also be that there are unnoticed faults, um, which will eventually just bring noise to your model because you label bad data as good data. And also, as Simon mentioned before, um, you have this problem of class imbalance. So it only happens very rarely that a machine actually breaks down. Um, so data scientists have to, yeah, um, you handle it appropriately and um, do some extra modeling usually. Um, yeah, so um, a good example um, for a predictive maintenance use case um, is the district heating system of Vienna. Um, so Vienna has one of the largest district heating systems in, in, in Europe, actually. And all over Vienna, you will find so-called um, converter stations, which um, basically transform or separate a, a primary network of heating energy to the secondary network which is the site that provides um, customer-ready heating energy to customers. And um, in these converter stations you will find um, yeah, heavy tanks, vessels, valves, pumps that run under extreme conditions and therefore they're, they're obviously error-prone. And this means that um, maintenance workers have to do yeah, regular checks and maintenance work um, to assure that there's nothing happening, um, nothing critical. And there's one big problem that every warning they receive, they have to investigate, because it could be critical. And this means that there are a lot of interruptions in their, um, in their work, and there's only a limited number of people who, who can do this job. Um, so just imagine in, in the winter, for example, um, doing a job um, inside somewhere where it's plus 40 degrees and you rush out because there's a warning from your current system and you have to travel all over Vienna to the next thing just to realize that it's some minor issue and then have to go back to your initial um, yeah, workplace. So this is of course not an ideal scenario and that's why um, yeah, we were um, we yeah, asked to um, implement a, a prototype for um, heat energy um, to predict faults um, in advance and if possible also classify the exact type of fault. Um, yeah, and this should enable more targeted maintenance schedules which then will allow the workers to, uh, yeah, or just less interruptions in, in, in the work. So, Let's go straight to how we solve this issue. Um, it's, in the essence, a, a two-stage solution mm -hmm. where, in the first stage, we turn the recurrent neural network um, to predict the probability of a fault in the next um, x days here. So x is, uh, was basically a hyperparameter that we uh, optimized um, to see how much in advance we can predict faults. And essentially, it's just a binary classification. So we want to, at a given point, we want to see if, let's say, in 30 days, there will be a um, fault, yes or no. That's, that's all we ask. Then you will have a, a prediction, a probability between 0 and 1. Um, and if it's below a certain threshold that we set, then we say there's no fault, everything is OK. But if it's higher than this threshold, then um, we, we use a gradient boosted, um, we use gradient boosted decision trees, um, which is yeah, uh, an ensemble technique um, very commonly used to predict the fault type. But so this is specific for allocation or? 
Um, this is um, the, there's multiple locations. Um, we, we trained the, the same thing on multiple locations. Um, it, we did some clustering and trained um, similar um, locations with the same model, but um, not all are the same. So it, it, and there were multiple models in the end. But um, yeah, just to give you um, just a, you know, a bit more detailed view inside this recurrent neural network. <laughs> Um, without also going into the um, basics of recurrent networks, I assume everyone might have heard of it before. Um, we used um, stacked LSTM um, networks, which is a special type of recurrent network, um, yeah, which has the advantage of handling long-term dependencies better. And stacked, we basically layer them so that we can call it a deep uh, neural network. And the input is a sliding window over, again, why amount of hours? So this is also something that we played around with to see where we get the best performance. And then the output is your probability of fault, as mentioned before. And yeah, so we actually um, managed to get really good results out of this. 9% um, of the faults um, we were able to detect um, seven days in advance. And um, yeah, here's a. The visualization, you can see the predicted faults are in purple and the actual faults are in blue um, over time. And the states is zero means normal condition, everything is okay. And the spikes you see here as ones, these are the actual faults. And you can notice, of course, this is over a very long period of time. So you might not see how close they are together, but on average, um, it was seven days. Um, the predicted faults um, were yeah, preceding the actual faults. And yeah, of course, you can also see, for example, here, this was uh, a fault that we didn't um, catch. But as you see here, still 90% of the faults were detected. Sorry, um, is, the, <coughs> is the deployment false positive there? or No, this is a missed. So it, it was an uh, actual fault, and it, it, it was missed. Yeah, but uh, but they predicted one after that. This probably is then classified as a false positive as well. Yeah. Okay, so you had false negatives and false positives. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And also, did you examine why you missed it? Were like specific criteria that even humans would have missed this one? Um, we did in, in some cases. So this is actually um, we weren't allowed to um, show the, the original. Um, so this is a slightly changed version of it. But um, actually, one time when we um, predicted something was a fault, it turned out just to be a change of um, yeah, um, the settings. Um, so something that then afterward was like, okay, this makes sense, and fair enough. But of course, um, it, it's, it's hard to get 100% accuracy. And if, if it's okay, um, we'll do the questions later. Um, I'll, I'll be happy to answer anything. This brings us to the next. Thank you very much. Of course, uh, it's not only important to actually make sure that your machines work correctly, but you also have to make sure, especially when you're producing something, that what you produce is of high quality. Right? And this brings us to the next uh, section, visual inspection. Uh, I guess the name already says it all, and most of you can imagine what visual inspection is. Namely, by definition, it is just a, me a measure of quality control using <coughs> human's ability, well, to see, right? Well, as you can imagine, seeing, well, are images, essentially, you know, and images um, are something that uh, is well used in deep learning and in machine learning. So, in the last, actually, decades already, uh, automation has happened uh, in the field of visual inspection, right? And, in general, we are not necessarily talking about deep learning here. The, the general process is usually has multi, uh, multiple steps. First, you have some camera that um, takes an image of whatever you are producing. Right? You get an image, then you feed it into some pipeline, and what you get, for example, is an indication of whether your product is faulty or okay. Right? This is the basic process. This question mark here is a question mark because there are essentially a plethora of approaches you could use. Starting from very simple, just you know, color histograms and using a simple, basically, threshold to differentiate between good and okay, and that might even work in many cases, 
For example, when we go one slide back, we want to detect uh, the yellow caps here. But the more fine-grained it gets, right, the, the smaller the, the defects are, the more complex methods, the more complex pipelines you need to use here. And in many cases, especially the last couple of years, people have turned to deep learning here because of the advent of convolutional neural networks and so on. And this brings us um, to our practical use case, namely uh, that was developed for Amoeba, which is a large industrial company based in Upper Austria. They are manufacturing industrial parts uh, for automotive, for example, also for large ships and so on. And basically our task was to develop, um, to develop a prototype for detecting and explaining defects in industrial parts. There are parts, the part that this was about concretely, kind of look like that, you know. Um, so this is like a rough drawing of a metal disc. And on this metal disc, uh, patches were glued onto it. Like small patches just uh, attached to the metal disc using glue. And most of these parts, you know, they're totally fine. There is no defect. But of course it happens that some things go wrong for what reason soever, and there are some defects, right? We call them ABC. For, well, for reasons of confidentiality here. Um, our goal was to first well, develop a self-learning system because um, there are classic computer vision approaches where, um, as I noted briefly before, where you simply do some manual feature engineering, some thresholding, and there you go. Right? But our, their goal was, and so was our goal, to develop a self-learning system that actually, you know, over time adapts on changing environmental conditions and so on. That self-learning system should primarily be able to classify between OK and defect, you know, to make sure that really no defect part goes out to the customer. But of course, it's also nice to know the exact type of defect, right? Of course, um, as I mentioned before, um, typically clients, people do not really do expect a bit more by now. They expect you to also explain why you model things, what it thinks, why you classified it the way you classified. Right. And that's why we went a bit of a step further and also pro basically provided a small web application that allows the end user, the layman, to actually inspect the images, see a model explanation, see why our model thinks, where uh, de defects are in the images, on the, on the part. And finally, the user should be able to provide feedback. Right? So, um, he sees an image and he should be able to say, all right, that is defect A, that is defect B, or that is okay, for example. Concretely, what we got was data, obviously. And these are the image, images that they are dealing with. On the one hand, on the right-hand side, you can see a brightness image. So this image kind of shows you uh, how much this part reflects, right? And you're probably wondering why this is, well, this is not a metal ring anymore. Well, this is the case because you can imagine they take that ring and spin it and have a camera uh, taking pictures from above. So you kind of see the ring stretched out here, the back and the front side. That's why it's not round. On the left hand side, you can see a depth image. So essentially, you have brightness information and depth information of that part um, yeah, spread over two images. We got 12,000 of these images unlabeled. So we didn't know if they're okay, if there's a defect or whatsoever. But what we knew was that the vast majority of these parts that we got the images from are actually okay, right? So there is no defect on it because they produce high quality stuff. So there are hardly any defects in their images, typically in balanced cloud form. On the other hand, we did get a bit more than 500 labeled images and spread <coughs> over four different classes. A couple of okay images, a couple of defect A, B, um, and C. So people, uh, some of you who are familiar and familiar with the uh, with computer vision or deep learning for computer vision, and you see that, uh, you probably see a small problem here, kind of, right? I mean, in general, uh, if your first thought could be, ah, I just take some convolutional neural networks, throw it at my pile of data, and there we go, 99% accuracy. Well, it doesn't work like that for two reasons. First of all, there is uh, just 519 labeled images. Second, these images, they are incredibly high resolution actually, and the defects in these images are incredibly small. Like it takes human experts minutes to actually discover defects on these images. So they are really incredibly small. 
So what do you do if you just only have 519 name images <laughs> and the challenge is hard? So we decided to first turn to the unlabeled data because we do have an abundance of them. Right? So what can you do with unlabeled data? Something that you can do is you can do some automated feature engineering to avoid being forced to use labeled data for training. So in our case, we used a deep convolutional autoencoder, which is essentially two deep convolutional neural networks plugged into each other, one turned around and plugged into the other. And that autoencoder learns to take an image, downsample it to the most important information that is contained in the image, which is called here latent space representation. And then it tries to reconstruct the original image from that yeah, a fraction of information that is left here in the middle, which could be as small as like one percent or whatever of the original image, right? Your reconstructed image will never be as good, as detailed as your original image. That's for sure, because you're just losing information in that process. But that's not the problem, because we're not trying to get the perfect reconstruction here, but we are trying to extract features that are really important to describe the image. So in practice, it kind of looked like that. So on the left-hand side, we basically stacked our, the, the, the images, the two images we got per sample, and the right-hand side, we reconstruct them, and what we get is a reconstruction error, the difference between input image and output image. Well, and that difference is visualized here on top, the reddish, yellowish areas you can see here. These are the areas in the image where our autoencoder kind of failed to reconstruct the image. Well, and that is actually quite handy, that is quite informative, because our autoencoder doesn't know how to reconstruct defects. Because if you remember, in our unlabeled data, only like <coughs> approximately 1% is actually faulty. And 1%, you know, is really not a lot. So our autoencoder doesn't know how to reconstruct defects. So what you can see here, the areas where it fails at reconstructing, are the areas where anomalies are in the image, where defects are in the image, where things are the, that the autoencoder just hasn't seen at that point, right? So you can take that reconstruction error, overlay it with the original image, and get a quite nice visualization indication of what is strange in the image. Just if you wonder, there is something cut off here, so uh, the images might not match perfectly, but it's, you, know, you get the concept, I guess. You essentially overlay it with the reconstruction error and get an, a visual indication a visual explanation of what is wrong, what is strange in the image. Well, of course, at that point, we haven't really solved the classification issue, right? Well, as it turns out, by just, actually, by just summing up, by aggregating that reconstruction error, a simple threshold could already allow you to classify the image perfectly in OK or defect, right? So that problem was kind of done because the autoencoder is quite bad at reconstructing defects. So the aggregated reconstruction error for defect parts for defect images is high. You can simply use a linear threshold and that's fine. But of course, our second goal was to also provide the type of defect. And that brings us actually to the next step. So what we did here now, we used the labeled data. Remember, we, we trained the autoencoder the unlabeled data. And now we essentially froze the autoencoder and used it as an, an inference mode, so to say. So we shove in the labeled data, and from the autoencoder we extract two things. On the one hand, we extract our latent space representation, the most important, the most informative part of the image, so to say. And we also compute the reconstruction error. Right? We take these features, so to say, concatenate them and aggregate them, and then simply use that feature vector, that resulting feature vector, as input to train another classifier that tells us the exact type of defect in our image. And of course the classifier is robust, the classifier doesn't need 10,000 images like some deep CNN or whatever, but the classifier is built and optimized to work on imbalanced data and small sample sizes. Right? So you kind of get the best of both worlds. You use complex networks to extract important features in the one step, in the autoencoder. Then you take the good stuff of that, go to the next algorithm, and provide that algorithm 
with your extracted features and use the advantages <coughs> of the classifier here, which in our case was gradient boosted trees, but could essentially be anything else that's adequate. Yeah, it worked out very well because people always ask us then, uh, yeah, what is the accuracy? What is the accuracy? How good was it? Um, we so on a holdout set, um, we classified around 85 or 100 images <laughs> of the correct type, right? And we got all okay and defect, right? Essentially, so it worked uh, very well, in fact. Yeah, this is kind of a, a small uh, video or GIF in that case that shows what the, the web app kind of looked looked like in a prototype stage. So what the user can do in the web app is he can he sees the, he can see the images, he sees the prediction, he sees where our model found suspicious parts, he can zoom in, zoom out, you know, really investigate by himself, switch between the images, and he can also you know, draw small boxes and say, oh, there is defect B or there is defect C or whatever. So uh, essentially, we can get the user feedback, store it for later retraining, and to aggregate it to just collect more labeled data. Yeah, and that's why I hand over again to Daniel about predictive quality. Okay, so yeah, so finally, let's move to predictive quality. Um, here, um, the goal is to be able to estimate the output of uh, um, yeah, the, the quality output of a manufacturing, manufacturing process from start to finish. Um, so you you want to have automatic and continuous quality control throughout your production line. Um, and you do this by <coughs> predicting um, the future quality at every process stage. And um, this gives you the advantage of um, yeah, being able to make um, proactive decisions. Um, because backtracking, you can then um, identify potential influence on quality and um, you know, change settings in your manufacturing workflow or your parameter settings. So yeah, at the end, um, it will save um, companies um, time, costs and resources because they can actually prevent quality issues. And the big difference to the visual inspection um, part was that um, with the visual inspection, you're at the very end of your production stage. So you have your finished good, you look at it, is it good or bad? But what you actually want to do with predictive quality is um, you want to know when bad quality is being produced before the part is actually produced. Um, or like at every stage being able to infer how's it going? Is it going to be okayish or <coughs> doesn't it look a bit bad? So here um, you actually can rely on a quite um, yeah, wealthy range of data sources, um, similar to the predictive maintenance use case uh, yeah, topic. Um, you can definitely leverage um, sensors. Um, literally, it could be the same sensors that you also use for predictive maintenance, um, because sometimes when a machine, for example, is faulty, it's more likely to produce bad products. And yeah, as with the visual inspection, um, most um, modern manufacturing facilities have equipment, imaging equipment that um, captures some kind of image. It could be just a regular color image, or laser scans, or infrared images. And sorry for this little issue here, but then you also have um, metadata, um, in, usually in tabular form. And here, most importantly, you rely on quality checks, which you can't see here. But uh, yeah, it basically gives you your ground truth. And other things could be um, logs of shift um, schedules, and also the maintenance records and fault logs of um, machines. It could be yeah, error notification, certain alarms that are triggered by your existing system. And yeah, so, so this is the, the view of a production line from the view um, of, a, of a data scientist, kind of. Um, in the essence, it's a, a sequence of, of steps. So um, you, you put in materials into certain processes, and from one step to another, um, this thing kind of um, transforms into your finished product. And at every stage, you have um, machines and sensors that capture 
um, your, your process parameters. And then at the end, um, this product might have some defects. So ideally, you want to be able to link um, the, the process parameters to um, yeah, quality issues in, 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 the, in the product. And yeah, here you also see um, basically imaging data sources. It doesn't have to be at the end, it could be at the beginning of your uh, production line or something in between or all over the place. And you have this big bulk um, of also uh, metadata as a, as a data source. Um, so you, as a typical problem is you have a sequence of processes and actually every one of these processes is again a sequence of multiple steps over time um, which in the end produces a uh, yeah, high volume of, um, of process data um, and again usually in, yeah, in manufacturing um, facilities you can't, humans can't check every single part um, that's um, produced with a throughput of minutes or seconds so you only have a small number of, of labeled data and yeah, again you want to accurately predict the quality of your products at every point of the stage and yeah, here I want to um, show a bit more of a general approach um, how we currently um, implement quite a lot of um, pretty good quality um, projects and yeah, without further ado um, I want to present you a solution that is really working well for us and it's namely to it's, in the end it's kind of a merging the first two things we showed you we, we want to train uh, recurrent neural networks and also train uh, convolutional networks to leverage all sides so first, um, we train LSTM autoencoder, which is the same thing as Simon described, just for recurrent neural networks. And we train it for every process. And use it as a feature generator, so we can extract um, latent space representation. And what it does, it aggregates the, um, the steps of, of these processes in a smart way. And on the other side, we also have if you have image data available, um, you want to do the same, you train convolutional autoencoders. could be exactly the same autoencoder that you have with the visual inspection. And you concatenate these features at the end on a more super process level. And then train, a, yeah, in, in, in our case it's mostly a, a gradient boosting model on, on the label data that you have. And finally, um, we, we really like to use SHAP. Uh, which is an um, yeah, open source tool for explaining your model's output um, to explain the, inf yeah, the influence at different stages um, on product quality so this is the same picture before just um, yeah, you have your data sources you basically train the autoencoders you extract the latent feature spaces sometimes you could also um, add information from the reconstruction error, for example. You concatenate it also with the metadata that you have available and the um, latent feature space from your um, imaging um, deep convolutional autoencoder, and then train a simple or more advanced classifier in it to do your predictions. And what this does is it actually gives you really good performance um, depending on the quality. It overcomes the problem of small <coughs> label data size and it actually also overcomes the black box problem because you, can, you can't really use SHAP for example with um, recurrent neural networks that well but by um, yeah, punching in um, information from the process you can later infer which process um, at, at, or at what stage the quality of your product is um, yeah, affected the most and you can also infer the quality at every stage because your current product model might be only at process A right now but you can leverage the data from the previous product um, over time um, so, you know, so you're able to make inferences at every stage 
you might have to leave out the imaging um, until the last bit. So you could have one model, um, yeah, you just spread it out a bit. One model for the very end, and another model for every stage. And yeah, um, so, so this is again only a, a little mock up, but um, it then with, with, with Shep, you're, you're able to um, get a bit nicer feature importances than you get from your um, yeah, tree. Um, tree classifier that usually also provides feature importances. But these ones are actually a bit different and they, they give you a bit more insight. So here you see that, for example, for product for 2, um, the temperature at process um, C is most critical for defects. And yeah, this is nice, it gives you an overview, you, you have some information. But what, what you actually can do is look at every single prediction. So this could be, yeah, this is one um, product. And at a certain stage, it predicts um, with 71% that um, it's for type 2. And then you can use SHAP again to infer a bit more um, about the decision making of, of your model. And here you can see that actually temperature C, this is the, this is the SHAP score for fall 2. So a high SHAP score means that um, it's very likely to um, yeah, be this kind of fault. And here you see it has a high score, 1.47, and red, the, the red values, variables here are the ones that push it up, and the blue ones are the ones that um, yeah, lower your score. And what you actually see is, so you have fault 2, temperature C, and this is exactly what's also um, reflected here, because we, we know from this, this more summarized view that temperature C has the most impact on, on the decision making. So yeah, this um, wraps up the, the use cases that we wanted to present today. Um, last but not least, also, um, yeah, we want to give you um, or share some learnings um, that we learned along the way. And yeah, something very important for, for me especially is to to start simple and don't over-engineer the details at the very beginning. Um, there's always time to do it later, and especially if you um, also rely on a back-end, front-end to have a, a, a full package, a software package, you have to be really quick at just implementing the complete workflow, provide the REST API to the front-end and back-end, um, maybe just with your baseline model. So, you don't want the perfect predictions yet, but you want to be able to have the full workflow going. Um, otherwise, you, you might uh, get really into critical stress at the very end. And this is probably something that most people know by now, um, that yeah, ensembling and combination of methods um, is usually the way to go and it's the way to really get this little, you know, to get the, the advantage of the, the head start, or, or however you call it, um, over other uh, implementations. And yeah, also a bit of a no-brainer, but especially when working with big corporations, um, it's really important for, for data scientists to keep the, the business metrics in mind, and not just worry about the, about the architecture and you know, what fancy stuff one could implement. And yeah, what we learned throughout the the months and years is that industrial AI really um, requires uh, machine learning all around us because there's so many different sites that you can leverage and also the backgrounds can really come to play. Um, me as a biomedical engineer might not be like on, on the first thought be adequate for industrial scopes but actually my background in electrical engineering and um, yeah, physics which I covered basically most of my course, really gives me good insights to do signal processing and yeah, other things. So it's, it's really good to have a machine learning all around us in the team. <coughs> Thank you very much. I hope so far you could take away a lot from, uh, yeah, from these insights. 
Um, I hope also the combination between you know, a bit of a theoretical view on it, a conceptual view on it, and then the actual practical thing is something that you enjoy. Uh, last but not least, if you have any questions, we will be here right now, of course. Uh, you can also contact us um, over email or uh, LinkedIn or whatever. Um, yeah, feel free to message us. We're always happy to answer any questions, talk about interesting challenges, maybe interesting papers you found, and whatsoever. Also, uh, yeah, we are hiring. Uh, so if people are here that are da data scientists uh, with experience in computer vision or computer vision engineers with an interest or even experience in data science, uh, yeah, please contact me. Then also we are looking for web, uh, for web developers, marketeers who are not only technical roles, and an agile project manager. And also, if uh, there is no fit for you in general, we are always looking for talent. Right? So if you are talented, if you are um, eager to solve complex challenges, uh, just drop us a message. Um, also, I hope that we also have some students here, perhaps even students that are about to write their thesis or are looking for a thesis topic because we love to supervise theses from an, industri from an industry side, right? Um, currently we have available thesis topics for bachelor but most probably master and diploma students this is more adequate uh, for uh, in the fields of reinforcement learning and unsupervised deep learning also on images. So if somebody is here and wants uh, to get some hands-on experience in the form of a thesis project uh, internship or whatsoever, uh, please also drop us an email or, or talk to me or both. Yeah, um, if you want to know more about Craftworks, so check out our website, craftworks.at. Um, yes? Uh, that's pretty much it. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope you enjoyed the last 45 minutes hour. <laughs>